I'm concerned about the work that everyone is involved with which is about really the etiology of sexual orientation because I'm concerned that in almost every instance in which the origins of any form of difference have been identified, the knowledge of those origins has been used in many instances in attempts to eliminate that identity. So um, there was a story I was told which I found, which was very sad to me, um, that there's this work that I think all of you are, uh, are well aware of that's shown that women who have multiple sons, the likelihood of one of those, of a son being gay increases, correct me if I'm not mm -hmm. describing this correctly, but increases the more sons that the mother has. With each additional son, mm -hmm. the likelihood that child will be gay increases by yeah. a substantial percentage. So I and my husband had children through surrogacy and I got quite interested in the area of surrogacy and talked to a lot of surrogates. And one of the people I talked to said that she had, had, um, a, she had been a surrogate six times. Now, when you're looking for surrogates, one of the things you want to look for is someone who is both physically and emotionally prepared to deal with the challenges that are attached to being a surrogate, to relinquishing a child whom you've carried, and so on and so forth. So surrogates in general, the sort of popular wisdom has been, it's better if you can to get someone who has some experience. This woman described having someone who had actually gone a, quite a long way toward working with her, who then read those statistics and said, you've actually been a surrogate, you've produced three boys, that means that if we conceive a male child whom you carry, the likelihood that that child will end up being gay is much higher, we're not gonna work with you, we wanna find someone fresh and new. And it was an indication in that specific and narrow situation, which is not one that will be reproduced constantly, but of the ways in which people, once they have an idea, oh, it has to do with androgen levels in utero, you know, can we test those androgen levels and can we abort the fetus if we discover the androgen level is too high? Oh, it's a genetic question, how can we find the gene? So how does the work that you do, which is essentially, I think, about at some grand level, not only identifying but also supporting the diversity of sexual experience, how do you deal with the implications it may have in narrowing those very possibilities. I, I, I think this gets at a great divide between the people doing the research and the public that's hearing about it. That gets at the idea you talked about, about how overdetermined human behavior is certainly sexual orientation. So, um, you, you know, we have to work so hard just to find any influence because there are so many different influences and you can only uh, find an influence by isolating one little factor at a time. And so, and so, for those folks, uh, I can tell you the statistics are that you have to have something like 12 older brothers just to have a 50-50 chance of being gay, right? But, but, but people don't understand that you can never uh, point to a given individual and say this individual is gay because they have an older brother. Right. Because of course there are lots of, most men out there with seven older brothers uh, are, are straight. Um, and, and so we have to sift through the statistics to find the fact that that influence is there and it's been very well replicated. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's and it's an interesting statistic in that older brothers increase the chance of a boy being gay, but only if that boy is right-handed. If the boy is left-handed, then this influence, whatever it is, um, doesn't come into play. And, and, and then when you realize, you know, seven older brothers and still most likely to be, that it would be silly, ev even if you thought it was okay to try to stop people from growing up to be gay, it would be crazy to go at it that way because it's such a tiny little influence that you have to use statistics to find it. And so it's not that it lets you know why this individual is gay. On the other hand, when, the, when you look at the statistics and find that effect there every time, you have to ask yourself, well, how can that be? That's something that happened not just before this person was born, but before they were conceived, change the probability of what their sexual orientation would be. You know, how, do you, how do you square that with the idea of choice, right? That they, I mean, who chose to have four older brothers, right? You, that's, that's, a, that's a strange idea. Paul, what about plus, a, Oh, sorry. Uh, I, I was just gonna say, plus then you have the baffling array mm -hmm. of possible genes. Mm -hmm. There's not gonna be one gene, there's gonna be multiples which act on each other, which act on each other during these developmental epochs that, that I discussed earlier, which, you know, at the end point, I don't think you're ever gonna be able to make a prediction from one of those. And I would guarantee you, if in some draconian future, you could identify many of these and knock them all out, 
probably you'd kill the fetus. So the question then is, well, you know, is this then a trait, is homosexuality a trait for survivability? And if it is, I guarantee you the people doing the killing are going to be ousted very quickly because you want that in the population. You don't not want it in the population.